and I now concentrated on these two concepts of sorting and sifting and said it out loud several times, sort and sift, and then again several times more, sort and sift, but I won't edit it, I won't change a line, I won't move a comma, I will sort and sift it, I just kept saying sort and sift over and over again, and in saying sort and sift out loud, I gradually succeeded in calming myself after all, I felt myself calming down while I was saying sort and sift. Which is why I repeat this so often, and again, sort and and sift I said to myself, but no editing, absolutely none. The mere word edit was always enough to nauseate me. As I wrote Hammer's major work, the paper entitled on Alt Sand, and everything connected to Alt Sand, and special attention to the code, which after all contains everything Road Hammer ever thought in its most concentrated form, and its most characteristic style as I perceived it at once when it first came to my hand on the hospital, and which is more publishable than anything else he ever wrote. I shall pass it on to the publisher untouched just as I found it. The first 800-page draft and the second 300-page revision of the first draft and the third version boiled down to only 80 pages of the second version. All three versions of Roadhammer's handwritten manuscript for all three versions belong together. It's deriving from the previous one. They comprise a whole, an integral whole of over a thousand pages in which everything is equally significant so that even the most minor deletion would reduce it all to nothing. And now I thought, again, this is the four polos there, that Roadhammer, after completing the first version, after many years working on it, then it being of two minds about it, and then substituted the second version for this first version, and then being of two minds about the second version, and writing the third version, each revision of the previous version, of which he did not help me of two minds. And then when finally, just before his death, on his way from London to Alton Sand, in fact, on the train, began revising his final 80-page version, correcting it and taking it apart, and thereby, as he believed, starting to destroy it, and proceeding to shorten even that latest, shortest version as he believed, to arrive at an even shorter one. Imagine boiling down the main manuscript contained in over 800 pages of material to a mere 20 or 30 pages, as I know he did. Anyway, his whole piece of work, to which he always referred to as his major work, his most important work, his brainchild, though he would later find fault with it and destroy it, as he believed that it was precisely through this process of always overturning every early conclusion throughout the whole work and correcting it, and ultimately he believed on his journey to his sister's funeral when he had passed beyond London to Dover, Brussels, etc., as I can see by his corrections, that it was nonetheless by this process of boiling down the work of over 800 pages to one of only 300 pages, then a mere 150 pages, then one of no more than 80 pages, and then finally one of 90 to 20 pages, and then in fact ultimately leaving absolutely nothing of the entire work behind, that all of it taken together was the entire work I said to myself, while thinking to myself that I dragged this whole thing from the hospital in my knapsack to Holmes Garrett, this so-called major work of Roadhammer's, together with the rest of Roadhammer's legacy, in the knapsack my mother brought to me in the hospital, and how grotesque it is that I dragged Roadhammer's legacy out of the hospital in this knapsack of all things, which ordered her to contain her family's provisions when she went to the mountains. Only such things as woolen socks and sausages, goose fat and foot warmers, earmuffs and shoelaces, sugar and bread all scrambled together. Just think that I dragged Roadhammer's legacy into Horace Garrett in this mountain climber's backpack of all things. And I have to say dragged it, as it is a matter of thousands of pages. However, as I know, it is a case of hundreds of thousands of fragments, interrelated ones on one hand, but completely unrelated ones on the other hand. And again, standing by the window, considering whether to go sit down in the old chair or not, I thought, I won't edit these fragments. I absolutely will not edit this legacy. I will sort it, or at least try to put this huge heap of writings into some kind of order, but I shall edit nothing. The mere word edit or addition was always enough to nauseate me. <laughs> on my arrival here, I'd actually only put Roadhammer's so-called major work, the manuscript entitled All the Sin, and everything that is all the sin, special attention to the code, into the desk drawer, while the rest of the papers were still in the knapsack, because I was uncertain how to get them all of the knapsack without mixing them up even more. I'd extracted the so-called major work and put it in the drawer and put the knapsack on the sofa next to the desk. There on the sofa, it was still the knapsack, as I now saw, was stained with dry leather blood, probably my mother's doing. <laughs> and I was now considering whether to unpack the knapsack and remove its contents carefully, all those hundreds of thousands of pages, and put them all away in the desk 
whether this might not be the right occasion while I was in this well nigh alarming condition, totally undecided and in a steadily increasing state of tension over the actual abrupt change of the weather. To remove the contents of the knapsack, from the knapsack, little by little, with great care, and use my head and keep my hands as steady as possible so as not to turn it seems to me the great disorder of those pages into an even greater disorder. This dilemma, whether to unpack the knapsack or not, drove me to the edge of despair. I kept changing my mind. Now I think, I will unpack the knapsack. Then again, I won't unpack the knapsack. Finally, I walked over the knapsack and grabbed the knapsack and emptied the contents of the sofa. I suddenly grabbed the knapsack and turned it over and dumped its contents on the sofa. This was not the time to do it, I said to myself. And I took a step backward. And then another step, and then still another step. And watched from the window how some of the pages slid down to the top of the heap of papers, which was still in motion as I watched from the window, where there were still some air pockets in the heap of papers. These air spaces caved in, and more papers slid to the floor. I clapped my hand in my mouth to hold back an outcry, and turned around, as if in fear of being seen in this horribly, this farcically horrible situation. But in fact, and of course, no one had seen you. I went over to the sofa to grab handful after handful of the Ron Hammer legacy and cram the desk drawers full of it. Again and again, I grabbed handful after handful of papers and crammed them into the drawer until the last sheet of paper was inside. In the end, I had to use my knee to force the drawer shut, which, between the last drawer, I had crammed full of bursting. Then I grabbed the knapsack and threw it on top of the wardrobe. When I went back to the window, I said to myself that I had done a terrible thing. But what matters, I thought, is that those papers are, in, are now out of sight, and I don't have to see those papers anymore. But of course, the fact that other papers were inside the desk, and only inside the knapsack, hadn't at least changed the situation I found myself in. It was an atrocious situation. If anything, my conscience was hurting even worse, because in unpacking the knapsack, by abruptly turning the knapsack over on the sofa, I probably, I thought, mixed the papers up even more hopelessly than before. And since Brodenhammer's papers are hardly ever dated, or numbered, or anything, as I know for a fact, there is no hope at all that I can ever put them in order again. Even to try to put them in order would drive me crazy. I thought over and over putting them in order would actually drive me crazy. So there I stood and said over and over that such a hopeless effort to put them in order would actually drive me crazy. I kept thinking, what a mess I've made. I know, what a mess I've made. Even if no one knows what a mess I've made. <laughs> I sat down on the old chair by the door in a state of exhaustion, of total exhaustion. It was suddenly clear to me what a hopeless fix I was in. I'd apparently, in a moment of total confusion, lost my mind altogether and grabbed the knapsack and dumped its contents on the sofa and I got all the papers so thoroughly mixed up they could never be straightened out again. So then I sat on that old chair and again said, sort and sift, sift and sort several times till I said it out loud, so loud, so often that I burst out laughing. Suddenly I was laughing out loud, very loud. <laughs> Afterward, it was quiet as ever before. <laughs>